Hey, welcome over to Casey's Corner. Today's episode is going to be really exciting and really, uh, let's say, empowering, hopefully. Not only exciting, but also empowering. And that's because I have a guest today who is a intuitive eating coach. And we've talked about intuitive eating before, right? It's one of those things where you feel like it's kind of a no-brainer. Everyone should know how to eat. It should be intuitive. But honestly, we are in such a society where we are inundated with different ideals of what food is like and what ideals of body type should be and all these different messages that just keep getting flooded into our psyche that really we kind of forget how to eat. We start distorting the way that we eat and the way that we nourish our bodies. Well, thank you so much for hanging out and joining me. I mean, I, you know, started following your account, obviously in search of my own inspiration and my own, um, clarification <laughs> around intuitive eating and just trying to understand what I need to get my brain aligned with and kind of figure out how to get rid of this toxic diet culture narrative that is in so many of our heads. So take a second and just share with us. So kind of my who name you is Alana Vandersloos. I'm the founder of Freedom with Food and Fitness, which is my Instagram handle. And I'm in training to be a certified intuitive eating counselor. So my job is to help women uh, heal their relationship with food, with weight, with their bodies, stop feeling crazier on food and implement the principles of intuitive eating. But I also incorporate uh, a, a lot of fitness into that because I think exercise and movement is really, really important. But as you said, and I, I've looked through your feed, I follow you too, and you have that recent photo of you in athleisure wear and it's like, this is what we see. This is what you know social media shows us. And then this is yeah. the reality of it. Uh, and it's really, really hard to to disassociate mm -hmm. diet culture messages uh, from what we should be thinking about ourselves and about everybody's bodies. Yeah, it's honestly, it's been a big mind shift for me, a shift in mindset, um, because, you know, honestly, the picture that I posted would probably be something I would have shared as like an after photo, you know, from like, after postpartum and when I was at my heaviest and things like that. And I've just, I've made such a conscious effort to get away from that kind of uh, thinking and that kind of comparison of far, as far as, you know, what my body looked like five years ago versus what it looks like now. And bodies are meant to change. Bodies are meant to shift and shape shift, uh, you know, all over depending on what's going on in your life. So I appreciate that, uh, you know, yourself and others in your field are kind of really being that voice. And I think that for so long, we had a lot of doctors telling us, you know, ideal weights and BMI and all these things that sounded so scientific and so medical that like we were doing wrong. But, you know, in your field, you're really healing our psyche, but also then healing the stuff that's going on in our bodies too, by right. and, and that's, doing the right that's things. That's really the secret to the universe is everybody thinks they need to lose the last 15 pounds, 50 pounds, they need to look a certain way, and then they're going to be happy. But really, you're, you're never going to be happy yeah. no matter what you weigh, unless you already feel happy with yourself. You know, it was always a moving target for me. I had three different eating disorders, you know, and yeah, and it was seven oh years of just torture. And I thought, you know, once I got to that goal weight, I was going to be happy. Like I was going to be proud of myself and everything was going to go right for me. And then I got to that weight and I didn't feel any different about myself. And I was like, okay, well, it's not that way. Maybe the next five pounds or the next five pounds. And at my lowest weight, I was my most miserable because I, I, I finally realized that that wasn't the key to happiness. And I mean, we see it all the time and it's logical. We see skinny people that are unhappy and we see people in larger bodies that are happy. So clearly the weight isn't the goal to happiness, but that's what we're sold. What you were just saying in the intro that, you know, we see smiling, young, fit faces and they look successful and happy. And we think, okay, so we have to be a certain weight or a certain size to get that happiness. But it, it, there's really no correlation there other than what the diet and fitness industry is trying to sell us. And they do it well, because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. Absolutely. So what in your experience really led you to this career in nutrition? You just said, you know, uh, eating disorder survivor, when was it that it kind of clicked that you were like, no, I need to now change 
or take my experience here and be able to put it into you the know, lives it was, of others. It's funny that you mentioned postpartum because it was postpartum. I started my business when I was five months postpartum and the pandemic, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And I just, you know, I had all this time on my hands. I was home with the baby and I just said to myself, you know, I'd really love to put my, my efforts into this passion that I have for teaching because I'm, I'm actually a high school English teacher. That's like my day job. And I, I love teaching, okay. I love coaching, I love cool. when the kids get it and they, I'm watching them grow intellectually and, and being, I, I feel like I'm a mentor for them in a lot of ways. Like I'm not just teaching them about English, but I'm teaching them about life. And I love that so much that I figured I could marry my passion for, you know, toppling diet culture with, you know, my love of teaching and really create something that was my own, my own business that I could make unique and mold in a way that people really need it to be. I think there are a lot of women out there who currently struggle with what I did. And I've learned so many lessons along the way. And I feel like I have the gift of teaching to give it to them. So what is it in your experience? I mean, I'm sure you tried kind of everything to recover from the disorder. What was it about intuitive eating that finally clicked or when did it click? I'm sure it wasn't yeah. an instant process. Oh, God. You know, that we always hope that like? the journey is like A to B and it's just, it's not linear. It's not right. easy. It's not quick. You know, diet culture sells us the quick and easy, sexy result, but that's really not what true, yeah. true health or healing is. It was, you know, up and down. And, you know, I had these little light bulb moments of clarity. I was um, following a blog by a girl who seemed to have the perfect life. She was fit and pretty and happy and had a great family, great husband. And then she was trying to conceive and she couldn't because she had a uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea. Her, her menstruation had stopped because she was too thin. Um, and she was having trouble oh, wow. conceiving. And in my early twenties, I looked at myself and I wasn't ready to have kids yet, but I looked at that and I said, Oh my God, like I could ruin my chances of having a family one day. If I keep this up, that was a moment for me listening to podcasts about intuitive eating and body positivity, I heard other people's stories and I realized I wasn't alone. And that's, that's really something I want your, your listeners to, to understand is that there is a lot of shame in having disordered eating or chronic dieting or hating your body. And that type of negativity feeds off isolation. And it's only when we say, I have this problem and, and start talking to other people and finding a community that also has that issue and people that know how to get you out of that issue that you really start to heal. So finding a community, finding a coach, finding a therapist, it, it, it makes all the difference. Wow, it's, it's interesting because you say how isolating it can be. Um, I was just listening to, do you know Jamie Kern Lima? She wrote the book Believe It. So she started It Cosmetics. I'm listening to her book right now. And she said something about how it's so interesting when you lose weight, you get praise. And that praise of your appearance then fuels the continuation of, okay, well, this is what this is what's making me feel loved. This is what's making me feel accepted, right? And it's kind of, it's just, it's a crazy societal issue, I think, that we have. And what is it do you, in your experience that in society, how is it that we've come to only praise and glorify weight loss? <sighs> That's a really good question. I mean, some people think that, and this is just one theory um, that it is a, a, a patriarchal construction, that it was formed by the patriarchy. And by mm -hmm. patriarchy, I don't mean men, I mean a society that favors the power of men right. um, to keep women down, to keep women preoccupied, to keep them small mentally and physically so that we wouldn't rise up. Just one theory. But but my my <laughs> my personal theory, and this is this is a little kind of insight into what I do with my clients, um, is I, I tell my clients mm -hmm. that all issues with body and weight loss and and food boil down to four things, and I have an ac acronym for it. It's called salves, like the salve you would put on a wound, and salve stands for safety, acceptance, love, and validation. Those are the four 
really big components that we as human beings need to have in abundance. And if we don't have those things, we start seeking them in other ways. So if mm -hmm. we want to feel loved, um, there is a huge association in the society that you have to be thin in order to be loved. So in order to find that love, you need to lose weight. So that becomes the, uh, the goal. But you can have all of those things, mm -hmm. no matter what you weigh. You can have whatever you want for your life. Go, go after this live, go journal all the things you want in your life. Not one of those things you can't have at the size you're at now. Not one of them. Yep. Right. Right. Oh, so true. I got a little, <laughs> I got a little chill there, Lana. Jeez Louise. <laughs> no, that's great. And I hope that people do take that to heart. Um, I, I do think though that, you know, intuitive eating is yeah. becoming a little yeah, bit of yeah. a buzzword right now, right? Like it's like a little buzz phrase, like, oh, intuitive eating. So there's actually principles behind it and everything. Sure. Can you tell um, us what you the know, principles there, are? There's 10 principles and, you know, uh, they, they range from talking about learning how to respect your body, learning how to cope with your emotions with kindness. Mm -hmm. There's, um, uh, diet, ditching diet culture around us, but then also the food police in your own mind. There's the idea of gentle nutrition where, you know, there's a huge misconception about intuitive eating where we just shove donuts in our face all day long. And that's, that's not the case at all. <laughs> right. Just eat what you I want. Love it. Just as much as anybody. So we, we, we do consider, um, foods that are, you know, uh, the, the new, the nutritional content of foods. Uh, we talk a lot about joyful movement. So finding exercise and exercise, and we do suggest exercise, regular exercise, but in a way that you enjoy, it doesn't have to be CrossFit. It could be taking a walk. It could be gardening or dancing. Um, and just kind of coming back to our bodies and learning how to tap into how we feel in them and just trusting them that our, our biology and our genetic makeup, we know what we need and it's individual. Wow. So there's definitely that sense of, mm -hmm. you know, we can just eat whatever you want kind of thing. And there's also, you have, at least in my experience, I've noticed that there are just people who are blessed with good genes and that can just eat whatever they want. And their philosophy is, oh, I always say all things in moderation. And I'm like, good for you. <laughs> good for you that you have can just do all things in moderation. But there really is a lot of work that goes into it. So what is working with you one-on-one -on -one as a coach? So I, I, I like don't do one-on-one -on -one right now, but I do have group coaching. I have group coaching. Okay. Um, uh, in sure. the summertime, I'm launching uh, a 10-week group coaching uh, boot camp. And it's, it's going to cover all of that. It's, you know, um, they get a welcome package. You do get one, uh, one-on-one -on -one private 30 minute session with me. It's once a week, uh, uh, live virtual commitment, one hour a week, you get accountability resources, guided meditations. There's going to be lifetime access to a Facebook group with anybody else that does coaching with me. So there's a community aspect to it. I've spent like six months creating this just pouring as much as I possibly can, as many strategies as I know to help as many women as I can. Although the seats are limited because I try to keep, as a teacher, I know small group setting is okay. key for students. So, but I'm looking for, you know, yep. 10 lucky ladies to, to take a journey with me and just finally get off that diet train. Oh, so cool. I, it's I, like your next baby. <laughs> months worth of, of work and nurturing. I, I'm and caring so excited. For. So I, exciting. I cannot wait to change some people's lives here. Oh, that's exciting. So looking to the future, what do you see kind of in our society? Because we're talking about how, you know, our society has completely warped our perception and how images in the media that we grew up with. And I, I mean, I think we're about the same age, you know, like we had those images of low rise jeans and the skinny arm and like all these things, right? That completely uh, dictated the narrative in our head as far as what was good, what was not enough and all that. Like, do you see us as a society progressing or do you see it kind of staying stagnant or even getting worse? You know, it's hard to tell because if you look at the evolution of the perfect body throughout the decades, it's, it's changed so much. It was, you know, the Gibson 
hourglass figure uh, in the 20s and the 50s. And then, you know, um, Twiggy came along in the 80s and everything was very stick thin. Um, the boy body, right? The straight up and down. And now it's the big butts. And, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it changes all the time. So I feel like the this body that we think is ideal today is definitely going to change. But I don't think that stigma against those who don't have the perfect body at, at whatever time it is, is ever going to change. So we individually just need to kind of change that narrative and challenge whether we care what other people think about our bodies, whether our worth is attached to our bodies. It's, it's going to have to come down to an individual level of just mm -hmm. saying that we're not subscribing to those messages anymore. Ugh, that's so true. And I think that that's it, is that we have to start empowering ourselves with knowing better, knowing that what you're seeing out there isn't real. And I know that the comparative, uh, the comparative narrative is very strong in a lot of people, uh, myself included. I find it extremely hard not to look through social media and not instantly think of ways I'm comparing myself to others. And it's not fair. You know, I just, I do really hope that we're going to get over boy, it. I know you just had a baby boy or girl and a half now. Okay. Okay. So I, oh my, that's how long this pandemic situation has been going on, huh? Um, <laughs> so you said you had him halfway through. So I, I mean, having a daughter, I am so careful about the way I talk about my body, the way I talk about her body, the way that we validate each other too, you know, and it's funny, I noticed my husband doing it, I, you know, having a, a boy or having a son yourself, it's interesting to kind of see men's take on this too, is they are being a little bit more careful. I, th I mean, at least I think, and at least in my experience, what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. although I still get some trolls every once in a while, but, um, you know, I think that coming up with the right way to talk about oh you look great don't discourage people from saying you look great you can look great but is it because your outfit is really fun and you like the bright colors it's not about you be it's not about your body in that outfit does that make sense i just i feel like that there's kind of a shift in our in our conversations and our dialogue that we need to right i i think i think about. moving away from from body commenting is just overall you know a great idea um yeah. commenting on you know, that, that was really sweet what you did for that person, or I love your shoes or your scarf or your eyes or anything that's not related to weight or shape, I think is always a good idea. And, and as you were saying about, you know, my son, cause, cause you have a daughter, so you have, you have a whole nother set of problems that I don't have, but in all the ways, my son, you know, I'm still really, really grateful that I recovered before I had children because I want him, A, I want him to be an intuitive eater. And for me, if he doesn't finish his broccoli, it takes all the energy inside of me not to be like, finish your broccoli because it's healthy because I don't want to, you know. That is so true. Yes. Oh, I'm doing the exact same thing because that's what's been oh, yes. in my head is the clean plate club. Oh, yeah. I grew up with the clean plate club, right? And I'm trying so hard not to put that on Kennedy where – you know, I say, okay, are you really full? And if you're really full, that means no dessert. You're okay with no dessert. And she'll be like, okay, well, I can move. She, she goes, I can move this over in my belly. I'm like, okay, well, you know, but tell me if you're really full, I believe you, you know, and if, if you are done with whatever it is on your plate, I try to make sure, you know, and as moms, we have a good gauge too, as far as is my child really full or, you know, not just exactly like your point, not eating the broccoli. But I do think that that's something, even as an adult, I think about it in my head. I'm like, oh, well, I left so much left on the plate. Like they're gonna be, <laughs> the restaurant's going to be mad. The restaurant's not going to be mad. <laughs> you know, but we have that kind of internal guilt, I think. How can you, how can you kind it of It takes a lot of mindset work. And again, that's something, that's something I coach is mindset work because it, again, it's not, mm -hmm. there's nothing outside of you that really needs healing before you, you heal the inside. So we have these messages embedded in our minds and like from a biological standpoint, it's neural pathways and they're giving us the same message over and over again, cause it's easier. It's efficient. We have them ingrained in us. And then, um, to, to erode those, we have to stop thinking those and start creating new neural pathways with new messages. But the only way to create a new neural pathway is through repetition. 
So it's hearing the same um, messages mm. over and over and over again. And that's how we replace, but that takes patience, that takes time, but it's, it's, it's so doable. So what resources and tools are out there for individuals to kind of jump on with? I mean, obviously coaching and workshops that you and your colleagues do, but what are, like, how do you start? Where, you know, I'm sure there are people watching and listening that are like, okay, this is what Come I need to do. Down. I think this yeah. for me. Well, first, Where do we go yeah, from Definitely here? follow me. Definitely see what I'm all about. The link in my bio has all my resources. It has, you know, articles I've written, quizzes, guided meditations, um, free resources, uh, recipes, my group coaching, any free, you know, videos that I have. But other than me, because I'm just one resource, I would say uh, search on Instagram for buzzwords like body positivity, weight neutrality, uh, intuitive eating, health at every size. Those are really good. You know, search the hashtags, look at the, look at the accounts, add, the, add that to your, inst your social media diet, so to speak. Um, and also podcasts. Yes. Podcasts were so helpful to me because it was audio messages literally playing in my head over and over again, and that helped. So um, again, weight neutrality, body positivity, health at every size, intuitive eating, podcasts are great. And the last thing I would suggest is the intuitive eating book. Uh, it's by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. Okay. Okay, awesome. We'll link that below along with all your other things too. But you mentioned podcasts. Tell us about your podcast. You have one and tell us about your guests, your goals. Yes. What's, so uh, what's going, my podcast what's cooking? is called <laughs> Finally Free. Finally Free Podcast. So you can find that mm -hmm. on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. The link is uh, in the link in my bio. Uh, and I have, uh, it's every other week. So every two weeks I drop an episode and I alternate between answering a listener question and bringing on experts in the field to kind of talk about the, the various angles of intuitive eating and everything that goes along with it, body right. image and fitness and, and all of it. Oh, I love that. Awesome. Yeah, I'll link that in the show notes below as well. And this is going to be a question I ask all of my guests. Um, so you are not safe from it. But if you could go back to Alana at any age and live that oh, life man. again, what age would you want to be? 2003, I would be 15. <laughs> you know, I was you know. 15. what were you doing in 2003? <laughs> and you know what, it was it was before my eating disorder. Um, you know, I like just started dating and I was like super boy crazy and I just felt I felt so free. Like I just like I didn't care what other people thought and I just I didn't have responsibilities and it was just like if I could go temporarily back there not permanently because you know life is great with my son right, it's so right. much fun right now but if I could go back to that time there also wasn't COVID <laughs> just, right. I would go back to that time because it was, it was such a simpler time all right now what advice do you think 15 year old Alana um, needs to hear she was still very uh, into grades, making sure she got the A and very hard on herself. So I would tell her mm -hmm. life is not that serious. It, it's really not. It's really not. Totally. Yeah. And maybe let her know there is I'm no permanent and record. And this is a story for another day, <laughs> but I, I'm pretty sure that was what started my eating disorder was all of a sudden I wasn't in school anymore and I didn't have a way to like rank myself or validate myself. I swear. Yeah. So I would tell her it's not Ooh. that serious. Go get a B. Go get a B in, in high school. It's okay. Yeah, go get a B in a burger. Go get a girl. B in a burger. <laughs> totally. Oh, well, thank you so much for thank coming you for and hanging out. Me. I really appreciate it. I cannot wait to see what is to come. And, you know, I am totally, I'm, I'm a fan. I am listening and I am watching and reading all of your posts. And where are you, by the way? It was snowing outside for, in your story um, yesterday. Jersey. There was snow on the ground. And now today it's 50 degrees, oh, okay. so it's, You're on the it's up, coast. down, all around. I, I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> I mean, I'm originally a New Englander. I, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. You can't rely on the weather. Here in California, I'm so jealous. too and sunny most of the time. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, come that. visit anytime. <laughs> Bye. All right. We'll talk soon.